Hi, my name is Kristen. I'm here at UT Southwestern Medical Center. And thank you for joining our live chat on donor breast milk. I'm excited today to be joined by Linda Catterton, who is a registered nurse and lactation specialist here at UT Southwestern. She's been here for more than 35 years, has lots of experience. Also excited to be joined by Dr. Jamie Morgan, who is a pro assistant professor in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology, who specializes in maternal fetal medicine and high-risk pregnancy. And we're also joined today by Amanda Alvarez, who is an, the Education and Enrichment Manager at the Mother's Milk Bank of North Texas. So thank you ladies for joining us. Yeah. We, you, a wonderful panel today. You know, I wanted to just kind of kick it right off and find out, you know, why would a woman or a parent need donor milk? You want to take that one, Dr. Morgan? Yeah, sure. <clears throat> so the primary benefits of uh, donor breast milk or breast milk in general are certainly um, in the premature population. So we know that those babies specifically, and, and even more specifically those that are low birth weight, will have the biggest benefits related to breast milk. Now all babies, of course, we would love them to all be breastfed, um, but clearly that is really where the medical benefits, because they are so much, they are much higher risk for a lot of um, complications, specifically infections of the gut, um, lung-related issues, and we know that breast milk specifically can decrease the risk of those those um, complications. Okay. All right. So I know that um, you mentioned it's important to premature infants. Can you tell us a little bit about about why? And is it also a factor? Is it also available for well infants? Yeah. So obviously, <clears throat> if mom can make milk, it's available for any infant. But in terms of, and I'll kind of kick some of this over. Um, as we go along, but as far as the actual documented uh, benefits of breast milk in the preterm infant, we know that breast milk does uh, have a, a huge uh, role in, in immune function for babies. Mm -hmm. So immunoglobulins are transmitted through the breast milk to the baby, and obviously because their premature infants are at so much a higher risk for infection, we know that the immunoglobulins are very essential to their immune system. Specifically, again, for necrotizing the pericarditis, which is an infection of the gut, that gut flora can infect the walls of the baby's intestine and cause a very severe infection um, and potentially very severe complications, including death. Mm -hmm. um, so we know that, again, immunoglobulins are very important, but particularly because that premature immune system in, in mm -hmm. a preterm infant. The other thing um, is that they do have their special enzymes and mm -hmm. oligosaccharides and other important nutritional value mm -hmm. um, that is in breast milk. And we do know that breast milk, for some reason, seems to fortify the baby's own immune function as well. Mm -hmm. So again, it's just particularly because they're at risk for all these things being preterm and very small, mm -hmm. um, that those those benefits are magnified. Although those benefits are seen in term infants as well. Mm -hmm. So, Linda, I know you, you've been here for a while. We use donor breast milk here at UT Southwestern. Can you tell us a little bit about how we use it in our hospital? Well, with the well baby population, what we'll do is um, give that choice to mothers. If she plans on exclusively breastfeeding, she's willing to pump, then we can use that donor milk as a supplement to the baby. Now, usually there's a medical reason that a baby needs a supplement, and it may be um, low blood sugar, it may be jaundice, it may be um, too much weight loss. So those would be reasons we'd use it in the well baby population. Mm -hmm. Now in the NICU, it's used automatically at less than 34 weeks and right, yeah, the whole week of the well baby. Okay. So I know we've got, we've got some questions in here for, for everybody, but I wanna go with this first one. And I think this would be a good one for for you, Amanda, and then okay. how can husbands better support mothers in the process? Wow, um, in those early days of hospitalization, especially with a NICU stay or the first few days postpartum, um, we see lots and lots of dads and grandparents and well-meaning friends, but especially dads, we see a lot of them at the milk bank um, because they're, they're wanting to be involved and they're wanting to play a role in supporting mom and breastfeeding and supporting giving their baby the best nutrition. Um, so they're doing the, the work, right? They're coming to pick up milk from the milk bank or they're running to pick up a prescribed breast pump or supplies that mom needs. Mm -hmm. um, they're kind of giving her all the support that she needs so that she can rest and heal from birth mm -hmm. and really focus on her own nutrition and do the work that it takes to feed the baby. Mm -hmm. How about you, Linda? Do you have some? Actually, cleaning of the pump parts for oh, anyone yeah, that yes, has done yes. that. 
So that <laughs> that clean the pump part of her mom. <laughs> that is huge. Yes. You want to add to the pump? Well, I, I would I would second the pump part. That, that's sort of the bane of most pumping mothers' yes. existence yes. is cleaning yep. the pump parts. And yes. so any little bit, and I, I'll say at least when I was in the hospital, the, the nurses are just so fabulous. But but the husband carrying that that role as going forward as the transition occurs and moving home, mm -hmm. that is invaluable. Okay, great question. Thank you for joining us. So one thing that comes up a lot when you're talking about donor breast milk or is, is it safe? I mean, what does the process look like for somebody that wants to donate their breast milk? Can you tell us a little bit about that? Maybe? Absolutely. So the process starts when a donor really figures out that she has milk that she doesn't need for her own baby. And that can be for lots of reasons. Um, she may be working and realize that she's got this freezer full of milk that's way more than her baby's going to need. Mm -hmm. um, or she may have heard about our mission to serve these medically fragile babies. And so she may not be a super producer, but she's just mm -hmm. sitting aside a little milk each day or each week because she wants to give it to the milk bank. Mm -hmm. um, but whatever it is that kind of calls her to want to help um, initiates the process. So from there, she makes a phone call to us and does a uh, verbal screening at the first stage. It's a lot like being screened to donate blood. So we're gonna ask questions about her lifestyle and her medications, mm -hmm. um, her surgical history, travel, things like that. Yeah. Um, it takes less than 10 minutes over the phone. We follow that by sending her to a lab for some blood work. Mm -hmm. um, we screen for several infectious diseases. Um, we pay for that lab work and it's different from blood that she may have given during the time that she was pregnant. So it's a separate draw. Um, but we make all the arrangements. We try to schedule it at a lab that's really close to her house. Mm -hmm. um, again, there's no expense to her, so it's not mm -hmm. necessarily easy. So for the donor, that's all her, all she experiences. Wow. It's 10 minutes on the phone and some blood work. Then we go to work behind the scenes. So we're analyzing those results, but we're also communicating with her doctor mm -hmm. and her baby's doctor to make sure everybody can get help. Everybody's got plenty of milk. Um, they're under their care. Um, and then once all those things come together, our medical director will approve them for donation. Wow, yeah. my goodness. So quite a labor intensive as I think some people imagine, right? We have full-time staff dedicated to it, but for the donor themselves, it's a very simple, easy process. And then once she's a donor, um, we can provide breast milk storage bags that she mm -hmm. can hop into for donation. Um, and we have about 47 different locations where she can drop off her milk. Um, that way, she doesn't have to drive to our office or to a certain, you know, location far from her. Mm -hmm. We try to put them out in the community where people really spend their time. Good to know. Yeah. So I see lots of questions. We're gonna we're gonna get to this. Um, here's what I think, Linda or Dr. Morgan. This may be for you. Um, are there any criteria for babies, mamas who receive the donated breast milk? You want to? Do you have any specific criteria? Mm -hmm. it, that they're willing to pump because we want them to uh, make milk for their baby mm -hmm. and not just rely on donor milk. Mm -hmm. It's limited time use in the NICU and in the um, well baby population. Mm -hmm. And um, so it's mainly that they're willing to pump. Okay, perfect. And then on our side of it at the milk bank, um, we don't have very strict requirements on, on who exactly qualifies. There is a process. so. Um, when babies receive milk at the hospital, it's all managed here at the hospital. Okay. Once they get home, if they have a medical necessity, um, we process paperwork for them. We bill their insurance, Medicaid, um, TRICARE, whatever their coverage is, we mm -hmm. take care of that for them. Okay. Um, and then if they don't have a medical need, but they just have a temporary need to supplement, so something like jaundice right. or a little bit of weight loss, um, then we do have a quick application process for that. But it's not a... Um, Hard approval process with lots of hurdles right. to get over. Okay. Yeah. Because there is actually donor milk that can, with a prescription, be mm -hmm. purchased. Okay. We do, um, mm -hmm. yeah, we dispense yeah. milk um, for healthy babies mm -hmm. who have a temporary need for supplementation. Right. They need a doctor's prescription, right. a very simple prescription to get. Um, sometimes there's a processing fee for the milk, mm -hmm. um, depending on right. the baby's needs but that's at a reduced rate and on a sliding fee scale. So the ability to pay a processing fee is never a barrier to ac accessing milk. Good to know. Good to know. Yeah. So could a woman who is producing her own milk, but maybe not enough, could she milk, could she mix donor milk and her own breast milk? Is that an option? It is. Yeah, absolutely. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, we know, that, we know that when women have a goal to exclusively breastfeed and they need to supplement, supplementing with donor milk rather than formula increases mm-hmm. her likelihood of being able to go on and meet her breastfeeding goals okay. um, just by being able to get human milk versus formula. Okay. Well, and there is a bit of a dose dependent. The more breast milk that we give, the, mm-hmm. the, you know, the better the health effects in terms of the more robust health effects we're going to see. So there is a dose dependent response. So it's not just like you just want to get that minimum threshold in there. We want to get as much. Um, human milk as possible uh, into the baby. Perfect. Thank you for the the question that came from our colleagues over at the Civics Cancer Center. Um, Let's see, is there, so we've got one here. Oh, a couple people that have received donated milk. We're glad to to see you on the chat. Um, Are there any diseases that can be transferred through breast milk? Yes. So you want to start with that? I mean, I'm sure that Amanda and Linda can also speak to this, but Obviously, we really worry about, uh, there are a number of diseases. The most common ones we transmit are HIV and C and D. Mm-hmm. Um, hepatitis A, B, and C can also be transmitted, although it is more rare. We find that in breast milk, it doesn't tend to affect the baby's milk, but it certainly mm-hmm. is possible. Okay. So HIV is a huge concern because there's a, a 25% increase in transmission rate if women, you know, if a baby ingests um, uh, HIV-infected milk. So that's, that's our big concern. I don't know if Linda yeah. had additional knowledge to that. Uh, part of the there are other infections and of course there's bacteria right. that we worry about as well. Okay. And that's where our health screening really catches that. That's mm-hmm. that's our first measure of safety there. So we do a verbal screening to talk about those risk factors. Um, but then the, the serological screening, the blood screening um, catches that. Okay. Right? Um, then we go steps further throughout the processing of the milk once we get it in our lab, um, where we do after pasteurization, so we pasteurize mm-hmm. milk. Um, that just means we heat it up to the right temperature and hold it there long enough to kill off the majority of things that could grow in it. Um, lots of those scary things like HIV and um, Ebola and Zika and the things that people worry about are killed by pasteurization. So we're able to pasteurize milk even though we know that our donors have been already been screened for those things, then we pasteurize to kill for that. Okay. And then the final step after milk is pasteurized is it's sent to another lab, an independent mm-hmm. lab, um, for testing, so that we're testing for bacterial growth or anything that was not killed by the pasteurization process. Okay, wow. Okay. So are there any, um, and this comes from our colleagues over at the Cancer Center, should an individual who is dealing with a cancer diagnosis approach donor milk any differently from maybe the individual who isn't? Um, I, I don't really, <laughs> obviously, you know, having cancer or pregnancy, is that what we're talking about here? So, yeah, yeah it's a whole lot unsure. of issues, and obviously preterm delivery may be implicated mm-hmm. there, um, and so certainly, I, I don't think, and, and they may, they're, they may be receiving chemotherapy or something that precludes them from breastfeeding, so mm-hmm. certainly I'm sure that those issues, you know, surrounded, I don't know, Amanda, if, if the mom is unable to pump the sperm, does that ever entitle the baby to, to for them to apply right. for donor breast milk? Right. So receiving milk from a human milk bank, um, we're governed by the Human Milk Banking Association of North mm-hmm. America. So we're affiliated with them, just like the 26 other milk banks in the United States. And we don't have a requirement that someone's pumping or trying right. to produce milk. Okay. We have a requirement that the baby in front of us needs breast milk, mm-hmm. right? And so um, on a case-by-case basis for babies who don't have access to their mom's own milk for a variety of reasons, um, we can look at all of them and see how much milk can we provide for this baby and what right. role can we play in getting this baby fed. Okay, yeah. that, that brings up a good point. You mentioned that how you're affiliated with this larger group. When somebody has too much breast milk or they need breast milk, what should somebody look for in a milk bank? Right, so we're looking for um, a nonprofit milk bank affiliated with the Human Milk Banking Association of North America. That means that that milk bank meets the highest safety standards to provide milk to the most fragile infants. Mm-hmm. Um, we know that peer-to-peer milk sharing goes on. You know, mm-hmm. people just whether they know someone or not sharing milk because they want to be kind and they want to do something to support somebody who's struggling. Um, but Humbana milk banks or milk banks that meet those requirements can really serve the most fragile babies because of the safety precautions that we take. And we're the only ones who can say that. Okay. Yeah. So we've got some more questions coming in. Here's one from Christy. For, for women who can't produce milk, but aren't eligible for donor milk for whatever reason, what are some options for them that help the baby? 
a tough question. Are there options for feeding for a baby who doesn't have access to their mom's own milk mm -hmm. or donor milk? Yes. Is that the that's, that's the question? The question to clarify. Yes. We're both lactation consultants, so why don't you start with? <laughs> yes. yes. And well, I'm well, happy to chime in. What does she do in that situation? Well, and you know, we do get a lot of calls from mothers who past experience they mm -hmm. weren't able to breastfeed mm -hmm. because they didn't make enough milk. So what, you know, we know through the research that breasts have more glandular tissue with mm -hmm. each pregnancy, so mm -hmm. this time they might be able to make more milk. Okay. So we'll just talk about, you know, even if the baby just gets colostrum, mm -hmm. the value of colostrum to the baby's health, and then maximize the milk her body can make because okay. it might be different this time. Mm -hmm. And sometimes there are stress factors that delay milk production right. where mothers give up before they might see if they can make more. Okay. I think that right. answers that question. It does. Do you want to add anything, Amanda? Uh, no, I think I took a different um, meaning from it in okay. terms of, you know, just feeding a baby. And right. um, yeah, they you know, have to be fed. Babies have to be fed. Right. And um, what the American Academy of Pediatrics says is, you know, the first choice is a mom's own milk. Mm -hmm. um, the second choice would be donor milk from a nonprofit milk bank, and behind that would be formula. Um, sometimes we hear stories of people attempting to make their own formula mm -hmm. or taking milk from situations that may not be as maybe another animal, mm -hmm. um, a goat or a cow, mm -hmm. or you know, mm -hmm. um, we hear animal milk. We hear, we hear all kinds oh, of things in breastfeeding, yeah. um, but really the safest thing that's backed by research for babies is mom's own milk, yeah. donor milk from a from a nonprofit milk bank. You know, commercial formula prepared to CDC standards and there's lots and lots of really quality instructions on how to properly prepare formula okay good to know great question thanks for everybody for all the wonderful questions you've been submitting we have a couple probably five or six more minutes so get those last minute questions in in the meantime I want to find out you know it you hear a lot about and this is sort of related about cross nursing and it seems like a very similar idea to donor milk but is that something that is could be an option if somebody you know is in a rural area maybe they don't have access to what we were talking about do we not want to promote cross nursing <laughs> we, well, um, I, you know, I feel comfortable yeah. speaking to that yeah. if you do yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah go ahead oh, okay yeah. well just to know that cross nursing or co nursing or milk sharing mm -hmm. peer to peer mm -hmm. you know one person to the next has always existed mm -hmm. it's always been a part of how communities care for babies um, is generally kind of quiet, right? right. You know, right. generally people don't talk a lot about it, and I think that's changed a lot with social media and people mm -hmm. really being comfortable asking for help, which is a good thing, and people stepping up wanting to help, mm -hmm. which is a good mm -hmm. thing. Um, I just think it's important for part of that conversation to be about the safety of knowing where the milk is coming from and the health mm -hmm. of the donor mm -hmm. and the health of that other baby, um, to make sure that everybody on both sides is really coming from the right mm -hmm. place, wanting to be helpful, mm -hmm. and doing the thing that's safest for both mm -hmm. babies. Yeah. Thank, thanks for the question. It's, it's tricky. I mean, there's yeah, lots yeah. of kind of intricacies yeah. involved right. here, and everybody wants right. a baby to be healthy and her mom to be healthy. Right. So I know we talked a lot about the donation process, you know, but for mom, is this something where mom can pump at home and bring it, or does she have to come to the mother's milk bank uh, to do it? So nobody pumps unless they just happen to work or volunteer in our office. Mm -hmm. Nobody's pumping in our office. Correct. So in that way, we're very different from like a blood bank, mm -hmm. right, where you go and that's where you make your donation. Um, our donors pump at home and at work and at school and cars and on work trips. Um, they're pumping their milk on their own time. They're right. freezing it. We give them some guidelines, but they're very basic hygiene guidelines that anybody mm -hmm. should be following. Um, so they're pumping their milk, they're freezing it, and then they're making deposits to us either at our location. Um, our, you know, our office is in Fort Worth, but we serve all of North Texas, Arkansas, and then hospitals and families all over the country. So the majority of our donors never come to the milk bank. We like it when they do. We have a beautiful new office, but most of them are dropping off milk at a depot, um, which is, those are all listed on our website, or they're shipping us their milk. Mm -hmm. So Texas has lots rural donors and so does Arkansas and so we send those donors um, freezers and overnight freezer packs and FedEx labels and everything they need to ship us their milk back overnight at no cost to them that's part of what we do we receive a lot of milk that way that's awesome that's yeah. amazing 
All right, well, I we are running out of time. I want to find out kind of from from all of you, you know, if, a, if what advice would you give to a mom who's maybe trying to figure out what's the best way to feed her child and either wants or doesn't want to breastfeed and is considering this as an option? You go. Is considering donor milk as yes. an option. Um, you know, donor milk, especially through a nonprofit milk bank, is generally a short term feeding option. Mm -hmm. It's a bridge between initiating breastfeeding and really achieving the breastfeeding goal, which might be exclusive or it might be breast and formula or breast and bottle. Mm -hmm. But donor milk is not often a long term feeding plan unless right. there's a medically you know, fragile baby who needs it long term. We have fed a few babies for years. Um, but generally, it's a bridge until that parent achieves breastfeeding on their own. Yeah. I'm going to say as somebody who um, I got the benefits of donor breast milk with my first child, he was hypoglycemia, and I had, you know, it took me a while to make breast milk into the mm -hmm. feed, um, and it was exclusively breastfed for some time after that, and I was just so appreciative of, of that option. So first of all, thank you to all the women who donate, because Hi. how amazing <laughs> is that? Yeah. Um, but second of all, I think that it's a really wonderful thing for and I think it's, you know, some, I don't think all NICUs do it, but obviously there's a lot of NICUs that are moving towards it. So I think it's such a wonderful mm -hmm. thing that we're moving towards to try to really support mothers. And we have people like Linda around all the time. She helped me when I was there, and they're wonderful. And so I think that if it's just such a nice bridge to have mm -hmm. as you're trying to make that journey on your own, you know, doing the best that you can. And whether that's exclusive breast milk or there's some combination there, mm -hmm. um, I just, I'm so appreciative of the donors who help those mothers who are you know struggling initially, mm -hmm. as and usually it is a temporary option, but uh, it, you know, to help us achieve our goals of, of having an exclusively breastfed baby. Yeah. Yeah. And we want to promote, protect, and support breastfeeding. Mm -hmm. So there's lots of different ways to do that. And then I also want to uh, be supportive of the mother, mm -hmm. whether she breastfeeds or not, whether she can use donor milk. And just one aside I'd love to throw in there, and I know we are all very pro breastfeeding mm -hmm. here, and this is a wonderful opportunity, but I also want to tell women, and I see this a lot in my office when I follow them up, is that it's okay. you got to do the best that you can. We have right. lots of options to help. Yeah. If yeah. you can use donor breast milk and you can bridge right. to making your own, right. or, right. but it's going to be okay. I remember so many, you know, crying, and yeah. I have patients do that yeah. all the time, and sometimes I think we drive ourselves yeah. to, yeah. to yeah. be a little bit yeah. crazy, and a lot of it is about breast milk. So mm -hmm. breast milk is wonderful. Yeah. We don't want it, but but that's what there's lots of healthy babies yeah. who are not breastfed. So yeah. I don't want to end yeah. on a non-positive note. Right. It's wonderful, <laughs> but I also want to say yes, yeah, support the yeah. woman, yeah. and we will support you through whatever it is that's best the best option for you and your baby. Mm -hmm. Definitely, I think that's the perfect way to end it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, I think you know the perfect way to end it. I want to thank everybody for all the great questions. This is all we had time for today, but it's been a great question. Ah, it's been a great chat. I can't talk today. Um, but as always, our chat will be here available on Facebook. If you have friends, loved ones, colleagues that are interested in the topic, please share it with them. It'll also be on a, our YouTube channel later this evening. So if you have friends that aren't on Facebook, send them there. In the meantime, I want to thank Linda and Dr. Morgan and Amanda for joining us. This has been an amazing conversation and I'm thrilled you could join us. Thank you. Thanks for having me. All right, have a great day.